Hello. Welcome to Boss Your Brain with Ashley Yagi. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a proud member of the Inklings group. And I'm so excited to be able to give back in some way because Inklings blesses my life so much. Don't miss this blesses my life so much. So uh, I'm excited to be able to teach you something that I love to teach about. I can teach you about bossing your brain, which I've been wanting to teach about since we did Sister Craven's talk, and she talked about that. So I hope that there's some stuff here that's super useful for you and very actionable. So just a quick disclaimer, I am licensed, so just this is for educational purposes only. If you need mental health treatment, then please seek that out. If you need help accessing that, let me know and I can point you in the right direction. So an introduction about me. Uh, this is a picture of my cute little family about 10 years ago. We've since added a son and aged <laughs> since then. Uh, but I got married when I was 25 and felt so old <laughs> in the church and so ready to be a wife and a mom. And I had a degree from BYU in marriage, family, and human development and thought that I just knew everything and was going to be so great at it. And on top of that, I had a master's degree in social work. So I thought that it would be easy <laughs> and got there and realized quickly that I was young and inexperienced and was suddenly facing problems and emotions I had no idea how to handle within myself and those around me. And I was often showing up in ways I didn't want to, like yelling at those cute little girls and getting defensive with my husband, not able to hold space for any of them. And so I was reaching out for things to help me and learning and improving some, and they made a little difference, but it wasn't until I learned how to manage my brain that I really learned how to show up the way that I wanted to and be the mom, be the wife that I want to be. So that's what I'm going to teach you today, and I hope that it's hugely beneficial to you. So we're going to go through a lot, and just want to give you that warning at the get-go, but hopefully there's lots of actionable steps, and just like in Inklings, take the sprinklings that are for you. Take whatever speaks to you today. You can come back and review this again, and maybe there'll be something else that you want to try to implement at that time, but uh, no reason to feel overwhelmed here. We're just going to take what, what we can and move forward. So the five keys are pain times resistance equals suffering. We breathe to override fight, flight, and freeze mode. And we boss our brain with thoughts and actions. Um, we use general wellness practices and we want to update our brain programming. So the first one here is pain times resistance equals suffering. This is a formula from Kristen Neff in her book, Self-Compassion, which is an excellent read, and I recommend it to you. Um, so in this formula, there are some basic tenets. One of them is that pain is something inevitable. It's part of the human experience. We're all going to have pain in our life, but it's not until we start resisting that that it moves us to suffering. So pain, not optional, suffering, optional. So we want to try to stay away from the suffering camp. Um, and since we love learning from the scriptures, I have a classic example here of the difference between Laman and Lamuel, who are in the resisting and suffering camp, and Nephi, who is sitting in the acceptance camp. This is chapter 17 in 1 Nephi. And starting first with Laman and Lamuel's perspective, in verse 21, it says, Behold, these many years we have suffered in the wilderness, which time we might have enjoyed our possessions and the land of our inheritance. Yea, and we might have been happy. So they're in the wilderness and they're wishing they weren't. They're wishing that they were enjoying their possessions and the land of their inheritance. And they think that then they could be happy. Nephi, on the other hand, this is scooting back to verses one through three. His perspective is this. He says, We did travel and wade through much affliction in the wilderness, and our women did bear children in the wilderness. So they had pain, right? Um, and so great were the blessings of the Lord upon us, that while we did live upon raw meat in the wilderness, our women did give plenty of suck for their children and were strong, yea, even likened to the men, and they began to bear their journeys without murmurings. 
And thus we see that the commandments of God must be fulfilled. And if it so be that the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth nourish them and strengthen them and provide means whereby they can accomplish this thing which he hath commanded them. Wherefore, he did provide means for us while we did sojourn in the wilderness. So he's accepting that they're in the wilderness and that they're having these experiences that are painful. But accepting it is allowing him to access the blessings of Heavenly Father, the strength of Heavenly Father, and allowing them to uh, bear their journeyings and stay out of the suffering camp. So I hope you see the difference there. Uh, we are here on earth to experience opposition, right? That's the purpose. We're here to get a body and to learn from our experience, which experience is generally opposition. We could not experience that in heaven. We had to come here to experience that. So here is one of my favorite scriptures. It's 1 Nephi 2.12, and this is again talking about Laman and Lemuel. It says, And thus Laman and Lemuel, being the eldest, did murmur against their father. And they did murmur because they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. So the more we know about God and that he is a loving God and that he has a plan for us and that he is helping us to learn and grow, um, the more we're able to accept what we're going through here. And we don't have need to murmur. We feel trust. We feel gratitude. We feel hope. So understanding that God is, has perfect love and he lets us go through opposition to exalt us. We are here to become like him. So adversity is an assurance of God's fatherly love and care. He's not going to rescue us. He's not um, as concerned with our present happiness as he is with our eternal happiness. He sees the big picture. So we are here to experience opposition, but he doesn't want us to have to suffer through that. He wants us to learn and grow and benefit from that. So another thing that we often ignore or resist is emotion, right? We don't like to acknowledge our emotions. We like to push them away. We like to escape from them. But resisting, ignoring, and pushing away often makes them stronger. I like to think of them like a toddler. So what happens if we resist, ignore, or push away a toddler? <laughs> they are so good at getting heard, right? They'll get closer. They'll raise the intensity. They will... Make sure that you're looking at them and uh, they're really good at getting our attention. So our brain uses emotions to send us messages. So if we ignore it or don't seem to get the message, it's going to have to raise the intensity. It's going to have to send it again. It's going to have to send it louder. So we want to acknowledge our emotions to our brain, say, thanks brain. I understand that when I see that, it makes me feel angry or I understand that when that happens, I feel sad. And just simple acknowledgement that we got the message. You don't have to keep sending it. Super helpful to not have to experience more discomfort or negative emotion. Um, another way to accept is using self-compassion. Um, this is from the book, again, Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff. And she teaches this three-step method for acceptance. So the first step is acknowledging that you are experiencing a painful moment. So that sounds like um, this is a hard moment for me or this is a moment of suffering. This is a moment of pain. Um, we don't want to belittle that or discount it or re resist it or push it away. Uh, what happens when we do that with our kids, right? They... Let's not go well. <laughs> we want to accept, acknowledge, and we want to be kind to ourselves. We want to say something that a friend would say to us or something that we would say to a friend, like, I'm sorry you're going through this hard moment, or yeah, it makes sense that given what you're going through, you're having a hard time. Um, doesn't matter if no one else is experiencing this same thing as a hard moment or not. For me right now, it is a hard moment, and that is real. So treating ourselves with kindness, considering our own needs. I have a sweet friend in Tucson who, when she feels lonely, she gets in her car and she drives to the taco shop and she buys two tacos and eats them and feels better. 
uh, self-kindness might be getting some exercise. It might be calling up a friend. It might be eating a chocolate. <laughs> it's different for everyone in every moment. So think what's one small thing I can do for myself right now that would help make this moment a little bit easier for me. And then we want to acknowledge that, again, um, everyone experiences hard moments. We're not alone in our uh, discomfort. These experiences are a normal part of being human and part of being part of the human family. And someone else is also experiencing um, pain in this moment. So we're not alone. And we could also add the Savior there, right? <laughs> that we have the help of the Savior to, to endure that. So another tool is we want to change our have to's to choose to. Have to is kind of a resistance statement. It's we're at the mercy of the world or our circumstances. Other people are determining what we do. So I have to get up in the morning. I have to get my kids to school. I have to read my scriptures. I have to go to work. I have to a hundred things, right? We want to change those purposely to choose to's. I choose to get up in the morning because I want to be there for my family and myself. I choose to get my kids to school so that they can learn. I choose to read my scriptures because it brings me strength and helps me to hear him more clearly. I choose to go to work so that we have money. Um, and knowing the reasons why we do things is super helpful too. It helps us to not worry about what other people think about our decisions or how we spend our time or if our values are right or not. If we like our decision, like our reasons for those decisions, then it doesn't matter what other people think and we're able to move forward and not get stuck. Uh, we also want to change should to will. So should is a kind of a guilt statement and our brain doesn't really know what to do with should and it doesn't feel good. So we want to try to change that to I could or I will. So I should check in with my spouse can change to, I will check in with my spouse because I want them to know I care about them. I should reach out to my ministering families could be, I will reach out to my ministering families because my savior has done so much for me and I want to do this for him. I should say my morning prayers can change to, I will say my morning prayers because it makes all the difference in my whole day. I should say I'm sorry can be, I will say I'm sorry because I really actually value this relationship a lot. So the 60 second summary of key number one is um, this concept is called radical acceptance. It's accepting what is. We're not pushing against it. Uh, we want to understand God's perfect love and the purposes of mortality. Understand who God is and why we're here and that he is trying to exalt us. We want to acknowledge our emotions uh, so that they don't have to become stronger or more intense. We want to use self-compassion and be there for ourselves through our hard moments. And we want to have that internal locus of control, recognizing that we are agents to act. We're not merely being acted upon in this world. We choose to because, or I will because. Key number two is we breathe to override fight, flight, and freeze mode. So first I want to just introduce you to the different states of our uh, body. We have that um, sympathetic system, which is ready for fast action and responding to threats to our life. And we have the parasymp parasympathetic system that is the rest and digest mode where we're recuperating and relaxing and thinking and making decisions and all the other things. Um, I want to illustrate this with a quick story. A few years ago, I was in a situation where there were lions around. Okay, this is a true story. And I made on eye contact with this uh, female lion. Is that called a lioness? <laughs> and she started to like move towards me and uh, started to get a little bit nervous. Um, and she eventually pounced towards me and I kicked in to fight, flight, or freeze mode and felt panicky, felt like I needed to act, needed to move, felt this rush of adrenaline. And the person standing next to me would not have experienced that the same way because 
she could see that I was safe because I was at the zoo <laughs> and there was a glass wall between me and this lion. And I'd heard that the lions would play with people this way and thought it would be fun. And looking back, maybe it was fun, but I don't think I would choose to do it again. Uh, avoid that panic mode. Um, but I was able to quickly see that, yes, I was safe. And um, the other part of my brain came to override fight, flight, and freeze and let me know that I was not in actual danger. I was safe. And then I was able to come back down. My cat is also a great example of this. I don't know if you guys are around a cat or an animal. They are either resting in resting mode or they are in like looking around, looking for dangers, um, thinking that there's danger. So we don't have actual threats to our safety very often these days. And I feel like our brains want to practice this. And so they have made all these not threats to our life seem like actual threats to our life, like running late to something or forgetting something or looking incompetent or um, making a mistake, forgetting something. Uh, these things all seem like actual emergencies, but if we think about it, they're not. Everything's fine. It's going to work out just fine. So we want to start to be able to Think about some of those that kick us into fight, flight, or freeze mode and coach ourselves to recognize that we're not in actual danger in those circumstances. We're okay. But I also want to teach you my favorite trick uh, that can move us right out of fight, flight, and freeze mode into rest and digest mode. Um, so in fight, well, let me start with put a hand on your chest and put a hand on your belly. And I want you just to notice where your breathing kind of sits. Is it up in your chest or is it down in your belly? Which hand moves when you're breathing? So if it's that upper hand, that's your chest breathing. And that is creating stress hormones that are coursing through your body. That's kind of that fight, flight, or freeze mode breathing that is more shallow. It's ready for quick action and it's creating those stress hormones. Um, the belly breathing is the rest and digest breathing, and that is creating the hormones that can help us to relax, to regenerate cells, to grow, and to think. So a much better place to be spending most of our time, right? I used to be a notorious chest breather, and I've had to work, coach myself to move that breathing down. Whenever I feel tense or stressed, I try to notice where's my breathing and move it down. So that's something that you can be practicing. And the other type of breathing that is like a light switch to switch this is we want to exhale longer than we inhale. Oh, I have this here. So move breathing down to your belly, exhale longer than you inhale. So if you inhale for four counts, you'd want to exhale for six counts or eight counts. So pause this, try it with me, uh, do something to show yourself that it actually does work. So if you breathe in for four counts, exhale for six or eight counts. I put a few images here of people who would be using a longer exhale for blowing on a pinwheel or blowing bubbles. You might be having that extended exhale. So you can use that to think about it. Um, it immediately switches us, tells our brain that there's no threat, we're okay. So I like to use this if I'm having to give a talk in sacrament meeting or if I have a hard conversation to have with somebody or presentation or whatever, um, something that is putting that stress uh, mode um, and switch back to realizing that I'm okay and it, it helps. So try it out. It's my favorite 10 second trick. Inhale for four counts, exhale for six counts. So the 60 second summary of key number two, we want to override fight, flight and freeze mode. We want to use that how it's meant to be and only use it for actual threats. So determine if you're experiencing an actual threat. 
override by telling our brain we're okay. Uh, determine what hormones are coursing through our body by checking where our breathing is. We want to allow for acting with thought and intention rather than just being reactionary or reacting. We want to move our breathing down to our bellies. Um, and we want to exhale for longer than we inhale. So if we inhale for four counts, exhale for six or eight counts. This breathing is um, great for falling asleep. That's a great time to practice it and helps us to relax. And it's easier to notice where our breathing sits if we're laying on the ground. So try that out. The third key is boss your brain with thoughts and actions. So now we're getting into the bossing our brain part. Um, a definition of emotions here. Emotions are messages sent from our brain based on our interpretation of what is happening around us in order to drive our behavior. So it goes through this lens in our brain to determine what should be driving our behavior in the moment. So emotions drive us, but we can determine what emotions we're having so we can actually drive us instead of just being at the mercy of whatever emotion decides to uh, jump into that driver's seat. So kind of two methods that I'm going to talk about here. The quickest method is we change our actions. And kind of the longer lasting method is we change our thinking. So first we're going to talk about changing our actions to change our emotions. So our brains work hard to bring to pass the things we create through what we see, say, feel, and do. Guess what? Our brain does not know the difference between imagination and real life. Someone who is wired up and actually doing an activity and then tests it again, just thinking about doing that activity is having the same stuff going on in their brain. It's crazy, isn't it? So if we are thinking about the horrible things that might be happening in the future, our brain thinks we're actually experiencing that. If we are thinking about the great things that might happen in the future, our brain thinks that that's actually happening and we're experiencing that instead. So I want you to keep that in mind and use it to your benefit. Uh, so I don't know if you recognize this example here from Cool Runnings. This is a Disney movie based on based loosely <laughs> on the first Jamaican bobsled team. And I have a few examples here from that movie. The first one is Junior in the mirror. And Junior is a character in this movie who doesn't have a lot of confidence. He uh, has a hard time standing up for himself or believing in himself. And his teammate is coaching him in the mirror. He's using affirmations. He's teaching him to see himself differently and to say things about himself that will help him to feel more confident and feel more capable. And those are helping him to feel differently and to do things differently. And he practices that just a little bit that we see in the movie, and it makes a huge difference for him. And the other example is Doris. He is the team captain, maybe, or like the lead on the team. And he is usually using visualization here. He's practicing ahead of time. He is envisioning the turns that they're going to be going through on the track and seeing what he would want to happen in those turns and going through in his mind what he would need to do to be successful in that. So would it be easier when it came if we'd practiced it beforehand? Our brain doesn't know the difference, right? If it's actually real or not. So if we have practiced it a few times, of course, it's going to be easier in the moment. Successful athletes use this concept all the time. So we can use that too. We can think through our day at the start of the day and picture us accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish, picture us showing up as the person we want to be showing up as, and then it can come true that way. So this is also taught by Brooke Snow. She has a lot of creation course that is offered for free. And there's a link to that in the last slide. And I do recommend that to have a deeper dive into the see, say, feel, and do. And I just love Brooke Snow's stuff. So recommend all of her stuff, but um, check that out also. 
So using our body to trick our brain is super powerful also. If we are using a power pose, like I just won something, like this is great, or uh, superhero poses, um, I can do anything, or a half smile. Our brain doesn't know if we are smiling because we actually experienced something good or if we're just um, smiling for no reason. It doesn't know. So we want to feel happier more often, right? So we want to send the message to our brain that we're happy right now. And with the power poses, people, they, there was a study where people did power poses before going into a job interview, and then the other people did not. And they, the ones who did the power poses before the interview showed up a lot more confidently and were more competent and did a better job in their interviews than the people who did not. So hugely powerful to be using this, uh, this stuff. We want to stand tall to feel more confident. Uh, we want to use mindfulness to be in the present moment instead of having our brain all the way in the future or dwelling on the past. Uh, that now hour that President Nelson talks about, if we're focused on the present moment or on what's happening immediately around us, then that will change our emotional state. We can also, excuse me, we can also focus on something. If our brain is just going, we focus on something in the room and that helps to change what we're thinking and what we're feeling. Um, moving our body, taking action. A lot of times we think, oh, I'll get around to that when I feel up to doing it, right? And it's really hard for us to feel up to doing it ever, right? But you've probably heard if we take the action first, then the feeling will come. So instead of waiting to feel in the mood for cleaning my house, if I just start cleaning my house and have a little bit of success at it, then I'm going to feel that motivation and feel the desire to be doing it. Uh, more so than if I wasn't. Also, if you are feeling a negative emotion, you can move states, move outside, move rooms. Those kinds of movements will also just give you a reset, help you to change your emotional state. Uh, so we talked about visualizations and affirmations. I do want to share a personal story about using mantras. I was feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome, if you know what that is, or just uh, getting into the trap of comparing or not feeling like I know as much as I should as a therapist or wh whatever circumstances I, I was in. Um, and so I decided to use the mantra technique and came up with the mantra, I love who I am. I like being me. There's no one else I'd rather be. And I did not believe that at first. That was hard for me to say at first. But as I started to say it, it got easier and easier to believe and to say and to feel. After a couple of weeks, three or four weeks, I started to believe it and feel so much more that I can identify with. I love who I am. I like being me. There's no one else I'd rather be. And I've also added a fourth to that. I am his. So I love who I am. I like being me. There's no one else I'd rather be. I am his. And that is such a powerful reminder to me that he's looking out for me. He's helping me. He has a plan for me. And um, we can do anything together, right? So come up with a mantra or some affirmations that you can use to help change the story that you're telling your brain, help change what your brain is working out to make true. And it works. So then going the other way, using our thoughts to change what emotional state we have. Uh, this might look familiar to you. This is called the thought model by some people. Uh, Jody Moore or Brooke Castillo call it the thought model. It's also the cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT model. Our thoughts determine our emotions, which determine our behaviors. Um, so we can use this to change the story. If we change our thoughts, it will give us different emotions, which will give us different outcomes. So it's a pretty powerful thing also. 
So if my kids aren't listening to me and I have the thought kids should listen, what emotion am I going to have as a result? This is kind of going back to key number one, right? I'm resisting the truth. (laughs) Kids should listen. I'm going to be feeling frustrated (laughs) and I'm going to be uh, reacting. I'm going to be trying to um, demand that they do things, maybe yelling or complaining. And it will probably hurt the relationship. If I change that thought to who says kids should listen, kids actually should not listen. They should be trying to push boundaries, right? Kids work is to push boundaries, to learn from boundaries. So if I have the thought, if my kids aren't listening and I have the thought, uh, kids are supposed to push boundaries, I might feel some pride (laughs) if they're not listening. I might still feel some frustration, but instead of moving me to yelling, complaining, and demanding, it might move me to creativity. I have to think of some creative ways to use my knowledge to change the outcome. Or I might feel some pride, which would lead me to um, building a relationship with them. So changing our thoughts can change the emotion. Another thing that happens a lot at my house is the kids put their clothes on the floor right next to the laundry basket. I've told them so many times to put their clothes in the laundry basket. And we've been through this many times and done the other so many times where I think kids should put their clothes in the laundry basket and yelled at them, um, told them they need to do it over and over, nagged them. And when I am home by myself and see their clothes on the floor next to the laundry basket before it might have put me into feeling like nothing I say matters, no one listens to me, all these negative uh, emotions. And that isn't going to feel as good as it would demotivate me. It would kind of stop my action, my productivity of the day, right? So if I change that thought to, I am so good at putting their clothes in their basket and just do it myself, takes two seconds. I feel good. I feel empowered. And I might also feel somewhat amused because this is a a funny concept to be doing that. So I can use this with all kinds of things, picking up toys, um, putting dishes into the dishwasher, I am so good at those things (laughs) and that would help me to be accomplishing things, to feel motivated, to feel like the things that I do matter. And I like to do this right in front of them. I'll pick up their clothes, put it in the basket and say, I am so good at putting your clothes in your laundry basket. And that is still sending them the same message that this is something that they can do and they should be doing. And um, I can do it and feel good when I do it. And That's going to work to empower them and help preserve the relationship. Um, So instead of getting frustrated at what other people are doing, we can move our thought to, I appreciate that he is trying his best. I appreciate that he is showing up for his friend, or I appreciate that he is helping his child or whatever it is. If we move to that appreciation thought, we'll feel gratitude and love, which will help to build a relationship instead of to hurt our relationship by some other negative thoughts. So I like to use emotions kind of like a menu and think, okay, what emotion would help me right now and kind of work backwards in the model? Uh, So if my kid comes up to me crying, I might think, okay, what emotion would serve me right now? And what thought would help me to have this emotion? So I think the emotion of compassion or curiosity would serve me well in that moment, better than my default emotion of feeling maybe frustrated that they're giving me more work or feeling frustrated that I'm being interrupted again. Uh, So curiosity could be, huh, I wonder what happened to them or wonder what's going on. And compassion might be, wow, they're really upset right now. It gets me out of my head and into theirs. And 
um, will help me to show up how I want to in that moment. So you can look back on former experiences and think what emotion would have served me in that moment or as you practice it in the in the moment what emotion would help me right now and what thought would help me to feel that way so the 60 second summary of key number three our shortcuts to success we want to be using our actions to change our emotions and we want to use our thoughts to change our emotions which drive behaviors so we can use power poses half smile we can use posture take action move our body we can create through what we see say feel and do using things like visualization meditation mindfulness affirmations and mantras We can use the thought model to choose the thoughts and emotions that are driving our behaviors. So powerful stuff. This does take some practice. The fourth key is we want to use general wellness practices. So here there are four pillars of optimal health. Uh, We want to be exercising and exercising is tied in so many studies to good mental health and it's tied to being able to sustain Uh, clear thought for longer or distress for longer periods of time. Exercise can be energizing. It can get the blood flowing, which helps with our thinking also and emotions. So super powerful. You can dig into the research if you need to have some ownership or or some reasons for yourself of why that is true. Positive attitude, we've kind of been talking about that one already. It makes a huge difference. Adequate rest, how many of us can show up the way we want to on not enough sleep? It makes it harder to uh, show up how we want to. It makes it harder to bear negative states, physical states like hunger or pain or negative emotion if we don't have enough sleep. So the goal is eight hours. Some people need a little bit more. Some people need a little bit less. And if you are a mom with young kids at home, just do the best you can. Try to find workarounds, sleep during the day, whatever you need to do to try to be getting that sleep that you can. Sleep training actually does need to happen. Um, Another thing that I forgot to put on the slides for nutrition, I like to use the app my fitness pal they have a free version that i use that i can put in what i'm eating and it will show me what nutrition i'm actually getting and it's interesting for me to see that there are some nutrients that we need a lot of every day that are actually kind of hard to get so we want to use that information and knowledge to eat intentionally eat for nutrition and use supplements as needed to have our optimal mental health, and physical health. And this does show the food pyramid, which is no longer taught, so please forgive that. (laughs) So the 60-second summary of key number four is we have to take care of our physical health first before our mental health is going to be in top shape. We want to get in the recommended eight hours of sleep. We want to eat for nutrition and brain power. We want to move our body to think clearer, improve our memory, and so many other things. And do what you can. Uh, The small effort effect, I don't know if you remember the conference talk from the fall about 1% better. Uh, We can make small, small incremental changes that compounded make all the difference. This is a gospel principle, right? The small effort effect. So do those small actions and they will add up over time. The things we do in the day actually deplete our stores of nutrition and rest, and it will be harder to do hard things later in the day. It'll be harder to be intentional about your thoughts and actions. So if there are certain things that you need to do that will take that brain energy, do them before you run out or rejuvenate somehow in the day. Key number five, we want to update our brain programming. So we have our primitive brain still running the show that no longer serves us. Survival was the only goal. It it wanted to conserve energy, perceive threats, and perpetuate 
we're no longer in constant danger. We don't have the need to constantly be looking out for what could go wrong, conserving our energy for when we have actual threats to deal with. And we also really needed to be part of a group at that time for survival. So that's where like comparing comes in and not wanting to be the worst at something. And those things don't actually serve us anymore. So we want to update some of that. So constant danger led us to be constantly on the lookout for what could go wrong, um, needing to be constantly vigilant leads us to have a discounting mechanism for good or novel things in our life. This works like if we were to get a new car or a new pearl necklace that we just absolutely loved, um, our brain wants to quickly normalize that so it can get back to looking out for what could go wrong and using our energy for other things. So we want to try to counter that because we don't want to lose that novelty and the excitement over things, right? And threats could come from anywhere at any time. So that led us to have this desire to conserve energy for when it is absolutely needed. So our natural man or um, our primitive brain say that we don't want to be doing unnecessary things. We don't want to be learning or growing or improving or trying new things or getting out of um, habits. <laughs> um, so we need to update our brain. We want to use best case scenario and mindfulness, gratitude, and affirmations, the atonement of Jesus Christ, and self-compassion to counter these things. So when worst case scenario comes up, we want to counter that with best case scenario. We want to say, yeah, that could happen. This could also happen. And generally, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, we also want to use mindfulness to, instead of trying to always be looking out in the future, we want to bring our focus back to the now hour, to what's happening right now, be present, live in that present moment. Um, Brooke Snow teaches that that's where God is. God is not in the future or in the past. He is omnipresent. So if we want to be with God, we need to be in the present moment more often. We want to change that discounting mechanism or the negative thinking by using gratitude. This is something else President Nelson taught us during COVID, right? He taught us to be using gratitude and that gratitude can bring the good things back to our mind so that we can stay excited about something for longer with gratitude. That resistance to change, that is definitely not a principle of the gospel. We want to use affirmations to tell ourselves that it's okay to spend energy on these things. We're going to be okay. Brain, I've got this. I know what's best. We want to utilize the atonement of Jesus Christ and the grace that Emily is so good at teaching us all the time, right? That with God, anything is possible. Um, he will help us with things that are hard. He will look out for us. He will kind of um, monitor the, the need to be looking out for danger. We have the spirit to help get, us, get our attention when that's actually needed. And we want to use self-compassion um, it is hard to do things differently or to make changes. So using that self-compassion all the way through to let ourselves know that we're, we're here for ourselves, We've got it. We're safe. Um, those affirmations and self-compassion are really powerful for this. So another uh, primitive brain thing that we have left over is this idea of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And does that sound like the natural man again? <laughs> so the natural man. So our brain thinks positive hormones are good for us and we must seek them out at all times. And negative emotions are bad and we must avoid them at all cost. So if we have this delicious brownie sundae with whipped cream, Oreos, uh, hot fudge on it and eat it, we're going to be getting bombarded with these positive hormones. And our brain is going to think, yes, this, this is going to keep us alive. We need to eat this every day, three times a day. And that will be so good for us. But we know that that's not right. Um, 
we would not be getting the nutrition we needed. And if we followed that advice from our brain or the default brain programming, we would actually die if that's all we ate, probably, <laughs> eventually. Um, so it can kill us. <laughs> and um, avoiding negative emotion means avoiding work, avoiding relationships, re avoiding uh, conflict, uh, trying new things, incompetence, so many things that are needed to help us learn and grow. So we want to get better at experiencing negative emotions and living in them and coaching ourselves through them. Negative emotions are okay. Jody Moore teaches that um, our ability to sit with negative emotions and deal with negative emotions is like the currency to do anything we want in our life. If we're able to deal with negative emotions, we're able to face anything. So think about that concept if, and see how it can serve you. So just my 60 second summary on this, um, we want to use best case scenario when we have our default worst case scenario coming up. We want to use mindfulness to move ourselves to the present moment. We want to use gratitude to be able to focus on the good things and hold on to the good things longer. We want to use affirmations and the atonement to reassure our brains that it's okay to try new things and to grow and to um, step out of our comfort zone, do missionary work, right? And we want to be able to question our thinking. This is called metacognition. We want to be able to think about if it's factual or true that eating a brownie three times a day is going to serve us or not. And we want to get better at being comfortable with discomfort because that will serve us so well in a future. So the review of all of this in 60 seconds or less, I'm not going to go through all these, but I just want to point out, look at all these skills that you have that you can dive into and learn about and use to be bossing your brain, to be agents to act, instead of being acted upon and to be improving and growing and ah, so many good things, right? So dive into them, use them, see which one, which ones will help you and start implementing them now. And I um, would love to continue this conversation. You can find me on Instagram. I started a Facebook group uh, for this, if you want to follow up and keep this discussion going, it's called Boss Your Brain. Um, and just want to really thank you for taking the time to watch this and learn these important concepts with me. And I hope that it's been beneficial to you. And I just really appreciate every single person in the Inklings group because it makes it possible. And it is such a blessing in my life. I love diving into the conference talks and studying the gospel with, with other people. So thank you. And I hope this has been helpful and um, also dive into the, some of the things that I recommended uh, if you want to continue to learn more and those will serve you well. And if you want to continue the discussion, come find me and best of luck to you and keep passing it on and share these things and that God is mindful of us and wants us to be using our agency in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.